Um, I don't really have a fancy PowerPoint, it's just a way to help me organize my thoughts. Um, I'm going to be talking about what I see as some of the limits on the reforms happening in Uzbekistan now, and in particular how they relate to um, what I think is really the lack of development in the civil society sector. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> I think there's reasons to be optimistic about what's happening uh, in Uzbekistan a year and a half after um, Mirza Yoyev has taken over. Um, one of the most positive things to me is that the impetus for this reform has come from the government itself. Um, it doesn't seem to be trying to impress uh, international donor sources. Uh, it doesn't seem to be part of courting the West. Um, uh, certainly not courting the United States, which doesn't really seem to be noticing any of it. Um, so I think that's, that, that already speaks a lot to the sincerity of the project. Um, then there's also been progress already. Um, there's been, I think, serious uh, movement towards converting their currency, which is one of the biggest issues uh, in terms of economic development, for sure. Um, and there's been a lot of changes in terms of the foreign policy, engaging other countries. Uh, there's been some movement in the rule of law, uh, movement in terms of human rights issues to a certain extent. So it does seem to be um, a process that is real and it's moving forward. Um, it's certainly not... Uh, a replication of Turkmenistan after Turkmenbashi died, where um, there was some discussion of reform and then nothing really happened. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, I think a lot of people thought it was a, a very positive development um, in this kind of State of the Union annual speech that Mirzoy have made that he kind of called out the security service, which uh, a lot of people see as potentially the real block to serious change in the country. So that's the good news. Um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons to be pessimistic about the extent of reforms, um, at least in the, in the current situation. Um, first of all, it's unclear to what extent the president and government wants to reform the country. Um, there hasn't, you know, there's a there is a reform program, but there's there's not really a vision provided of what Uzbekistan is going to look like in the future. Um, does it is is this really just about fostering foreign investment and economic development? Um, I think there's a case to be made that that's the the biggest priority with the government, that they want to bring in more foreign investment, they need economic development, um, they have a huge unemployment problem, uh, and I think there's a, a sophisticated recognition on the, the part of the government as to the different things that go into attracting foreign investment, that it, you do have to deal with things like human rights, um, you do have to deal with things like the accountability of the government and so on. Um, is it is this an attempt to create a softer authoritarianism in Uzbekistan? Um, is Mirza Yoyev does he Im, does he imagine Uzbekistan in ten years looking like uh, Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan? Um, that is very possible, but again, we don't really know. And finally, you know, there's the possibility that. Um, the government really wants to liberalize society um, to a large extent. I think it's more likely that their vision of what a liberal, more liberal society and a, a more vibrant economy looks like is more like that of Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan, which of course I think would be a serious improvement um, for the people of Uzbekistan. But what I want to talk about today is <clears throat> it's, un it's unclear whether they can really make even the steps to liberalize to the extent of some of the other countries in the region that have been successful, 
with the present situation in the civil society, which is really dormant. Um, and um, there's no signs that anything's changing on this front as of yet. Um, this is an area I think that um, it's it's there's a lot of reasons potentially why nothing's happening in this area, but I think it is a critical part of um, reforming the country. And just to be clear, I wanted to mention what I mean by civil society because there's obviously a lot of different um, conceptions of civil society, and by by a lot of standards, there is a vibrant civil society in Uzbekistan in kind of informal sectors and so on. But here I'm talking really about organizations of citizens independent of the government, which are interested in being involved in the politics of society, at least as we understand that with a little p. So not necessarily vying for um, being a part of the electoral system, uh, but at least being involved in policy discussions. Um, and um, helping the helping hold the state accountable uh, for its policies, uh, some cases maybe even implementing policies or certainly um, uh, helping to realize policies. Uh, and so you can see where where this is a real need if you have a state that uh, or part of the state that is proclaiming it wants these major changes, um, and by all accounts is is starting to feel frustrated that it's not that easy to just change things, even from the top down, um, it would be very helpful if there were organizations independent of the state that could be involved in this process. Um, and of course, such organizations could be informal, but to really uh, have serious impact, I think you need more formalized, more professional type organizations. Um, so. To talk more specifically about why I think this is important to the reforms, um, without a more vibrant civil society, the country's population uh, will not increase its involvement in reforms, and the country will experience less innovation. I think I think that that's the case. It's difficult to just kind of mandate people, please participate in governance. Uh, I think that's something that is not going to um, result in much change. Um, in terms of the agenda of accountability and making government more efficient, which has been a big part of what the president of Uzbekistan is trying to do, civil society organizations um, can play a, a very significant role in that, um, and in terms of being watchdogs, etc. Um, and then, you know, uh, I think to a certain extent, um, you know, Mirza Yoyev's own political power base is, um, it's fragile. Um, there's assumptions we don't, it's, it's very difficult to see inside the black box of um, Uzbekistan's elite politics. But there's assumptions that there are parts of the elite that are not um, entirely thrilled with all these plans. Um, and so having organizations that aren't identified as just proxies of um, the president, but are actually independent organizations that would support the reforms, I think would go a long way to um, increasing his own popular base and um, ensuring that his power is consolidated. So I think it's worthwhile to explain, you know, for those of you who haven't follow the evolution of Uzbekistan civil society over time, just to talk a little bit about what, what has happened in the past in Uzbekistan that leads me to say that right now there really is no independent civil society in the country. Um, so in the 1990s, um, emerging from the Soviet Union, obviously most citizen organizations were connected to the state in some way or another. Um, this began to change somewhat in the 90s uh, throughout Central Asia. Uh, it was both fueled by international development organizations and their funding, and um, also by the, the government's actual allowance of the appearance of these organizations. Um, 
Now, I, I think nowhere in Central Asia were the governments uh, very thrilled about uh, the emergence of these organizations or willing to allow them to become serious political actors. But you did see um, them emerging as a force in society that was um, able to engage on various policies. And um, in Uzbekistan in the 90s, you didn't see uh, the same degree of development as you saw in Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan, but there were organizations, um, you know, within certain limits. Uh, the, the government was very quick to um, shut down uh, any activities of human rights organizations, organizations that were specifically focused on democratization. But when it came to organizations that were focused on women's rights, on health care issues, on um, uh, domestic violence, these type of issues, there was a plethora of groups developing in the 90s. Um, and if this had continued to exist, at least right now the Uzbek government would have something to kind of work with. Some people who have some expertise and some skills in trying to engage policy and possibly trying to help the government realize reforms. However, this changed a lot in 2005. When, when I was in Uzbekistan last April meeting with government officials, I found myself uh, frequently bringing up 2005, you know, which is kind of a euphemism for Andrijan. But um, everybody knew what you're talking about. Things changed drastically in the country in 2005. Um, and it actually started before Andrijan. Because following the colored revolutions in Georgia, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan, the government already started cracking down on civil society. There was a general idea throughout the whole former Soviet Union um, that was, was also further propagated by Russian media that uh, these revolutions were basically a conspiracy of the West, that um, it was all about the West's supposed development of civil society, and this is what their actual plan was. And so um, there was already, I mean, I, I was working for USAID at that time, and before Andijan, I was actually in Tashkent the day of the massacres in Andijan, and I was there because um, they had arrested one of the local employees of an international organization that USAID funded. Um, and uh, I was dealing with the Ministry of Justice and so on. So there was already this crackdown, but then after Andijan, things really changed significantly. Um, international NGOs working with civil society were, uh, for the most part, with a very few exceptions, banished from the country. Uh, local organizations were forced to re-register, and most of them were denied re-registration. And uh, there was a monitoring system set up to regulate all international organizations uh, that were providing support to civil society organizations. They had to report to the Ministry of Justice about any activities they were doing with local organizations. Uh, they had to get approval uh, from, from the Ministry of Justice for any grants that were given to organizations. And they had to go through these state bank accounts um, and there was created this network of government organized NGOs or gongos um, that were created essentially as gatekeepers to deal with international organizations that were doing work in the country. Um, and they generally were also kind of a net for capturing foreign aid that was aimed at civil society. So, that was 2005, and the thing is, um, right now the situation is almost identical to that. Um, very little has changed. And I, I want to focus in particular on these gongos because I think that um, they create a, a serious problem because it's in their interest now to not change the situation because they, they have a monopoly on any kind of foreign assistance that's targeting civil society. 
Um, and, you know, even if the government told them that they should try to uh, drop a plan on how to create a more independent civil society, uh, in all likelihood they would not really want to do that. Um, <clears throat> uh, but that said, these organizations are not evil. Um, I think they actually are playing a, a major role in the reform process. Um, I'll just put up some of their names. Um, this one will be familiar to Navajar. Um, Naismi, or the National Association of Electronic Media, which is kind of the gatekeeper of anything dealing with quote unquote independent media in Uzbekistan. Uh, Nana Uz, the National Association of Non Commercial and Non Governmental Organizations. Um, NINFAGO, which is my favorite, um, is the Independent Institute for the Monitoring of the Formation of Civil Society. Um, and, uh, and then, in addition, there's um, the Union of Women. And when I was in, in the country in April, I met with actually all these organizations um, as I, I was doing some work for USAID and international donors, basically you have to meet with these organizations if you want to try to talk to anybody in the quote unquote civil society. And um, they were under a lot of pressure to come up with actual plans about how to realize the president's reform agenda. Uh, and they were swimming, you know, not having the capacity to actually do that. Um, but to a certain extent, I think they were, you know, they were playing an important role. Um, and they were playing a role that's probably more suited to them as essentially state-supported think tanks, um, which is what they really are. Um, and um, to a certain extent, that that's an important function. Um, but they're not independent civil society voices that are um, going to provide any kind of linkage to the population writ large. Um, so I'll just end my um, talk with um, how can Uzbekistan revive its civil society? Um, it's going to sound simple, but then I'll also explain why it might not be so simple. Um, so first of all, they need to remove restrictions on international organizations funding local organizations. I mean, if they really want to get international development assistance with the reform agenda, you can't really implement foreign assistance without this, unless you're just, you know, the World Bank um, providing a loan um, and individual expertise. But if but most development organizations work in conjunction with local organizations and um, without, without removing these restrictions, it's, it's just too onerous to really do anything um, or have any really significant results. Um, but I should mention that one of the reasons this is a problem is the Ministry of Justice has vested interest in the situation not changing because they have a ton of power right now in terms of being being the gatekeeper to deciding um, what kind of work is done with local organizations what funding goes to which organizations um, so there there's there's a reason that you don't see this changing immediately um, now, making the registration of uh, a civil society organization easy again, um, and just allowing people to start registering organizations. Uh, it sounds simple, of course, I think, given where Uzbekistan's coming from, um, you know, that's a big leap for them to just say, well, all right, we're just going to let citizens organize. Um, that doesn't necessarily fit in with the top-down reform program that's um, been presented so far. But I think it could be a really, um, a really positive thing overall for the reform agenda. Um, and then, uh, you know, encouraging donors to support the development of new organizations. 
and establish processes where local organizations can uh, engage with the government on the reform process. You know, right now they have established a very interesting, again, it's called an NGO, but it's really a government-linked think tank, um, uh, the Center for Development Strategy, um, that's trying to do this, but they're trying to do it all on their own. Um, and they're too close to the government to really be able to get down to the grassroots. So it's a, it's a real challenge unless you actually allow people to organize themselves. Um, and then finally, they're going to have to deal with these gongos. Um, they're going to have to, uh, they're going to try, they're, I, I imagine they're going to resist changing the situation uh, where they have a complete monopoly over the concept of civil society in Uzbekistan. And, um, you know, they could be reformed into think tanks, they could be dissolved, they could just be cut off for funding. Um, but um, I think these are the things that have to happen, and the question is whether, I think this is a real bellwether issue in terms of seeing where the government wants to go and how risky they want to be in terms of engaging uh, the citizens of the country. Thank you. Well, now that we have established what's going on with the civil society, talking about media will be easy. <laughs> uh, there is a lot to, to cover, so I've, I have my notes here. I hope I'll have enough time to go over all of them. Um, it's great to be a part of this panel, uh, both as a, an observer of the media environment in Uzbekistan, but also as a player. Um, I work for the Voice of America, so I target Uzbekistan and the Uzbek-speaking audiences um, daily, um, on a daily basis. I'm, I'm not talking on behalf of the Voice of America, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have about our work, about our content. Um, Obviously, the, the main question I think everybody wonders about is how free are Uzbek media today than, than they were, let's say, um, a year ago. Uh, I'll be blunt, this is really the central question, uh, because professional journalism, as many of you know, requires a minimum degree of freedom. You know, um, the, the freedom to choose a story, to choose a topic, the freedom to research, to interview, the freedom to process that information, the freedom to broadcast it or publish it. And if somebody tells you that this or that story is off limits, obviously that's a constraint on you, and thus you cannot be a professional journalist. So um, there have been some short periods of uh, awakening and uh, hard-hitting um, coverage in Uzbekistan, but in general the country doesn't really have much, journalists in the country don't really have much experience with freedom. Um, Uzbekistan doesn't have much know-how when it comes to um, to media, and we have to be really honest about it because uh, Uzbek journalists have always been the obedient followers of the political leadership, and um, you know, so the history of them being as the agents of change, or let's say, you know, media serving as the watchdog, trying to hold people responsible, uh, you know, let alone accountable for their actions. You, you don't see that much because it's been so deeply conditioned to, um, to serve as the mouthpiece of the government that even when now some of the leaders in the country are challenging the media by saying you got to be you know, more professional, you got to be you know, hard, media either don't dare to do that or they just don't know how to do it. And they, they, some of them are very open about that uh, because the news for them is still what the authorities say is news. And uh, so when you watch Uzbek television, when you listen to um, you know, Uzbek programs, or when you read news in Uzbekistan or about Uzbekistan coming out of the country, um, you see the coverage of meetings after meetings, uh, forums, gatherings, where people are really talking about what the government has been saying, what to do, and how to be based on how the state is outlining things for them. There are many critical thinkers uh, in Uzbekistan among journalists, but you don't see them. You don't see that in their work because they are afraid. They are afraid of the implications. They are afraid of their management. They are afraid of the regime not liking their work. Uh, but we have seen a lot of change uh, in the over the past year. Tiny steps, 
steps, but I think these are remarkable developments in media. From my own experience, I can tell you that the Uzbek media, which once wouldn't even dare to touch our content, um, and we're always, we've always been seen as the softest, uh, you know, if we were to be compared to BBC Uzbek and, and Radio Liberty, our sister organization, they wouldn't even, you know, uh, touch our content. Now, sometimes, they are publishing our content in full. I mean, the latest example would be uh, our interview, my interview with Ambassador Tamla Spratlin of the United States in, in Tashkent. When she came here recently, we got to talk. It was a very open, candid conversation with her. And the Uzbek National News Agency um, decided to post that interview uh, in full. With full credit to the Voice of America, they didn't edit it, they didn't cut anything out. They actually even teased and promoted it ahead of time. And they have at times been publishing commentaries basically out of my mouth as it goes on the air, uh, you know, on, on VOA Uzbek. So obviously we're like that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's not just us. Um, uh, BBC Uzbek and uh, RFURL gets quoted, gets referenced a lot nowadays. And journalists make references to our work. Uh, they touch, you know, whenever they are talking about some of the most sensitive issues, they always attribute it. So th we see some signs of professional um, approach, professional, you know, um, uh, attempt. But of course, they're very careful. You know, they are, they are very careful, they are very tactical in some ways, but they have been indicating to us that they want to connect. Basically, they want to connect with Uzbek journalists outside of Uzbekistan. They want to have a professional relationship. And to me, that is the most significant change. You know, as someone who's, who started her career in Uzbekistan, I come out of the Uzbek you know, state uh, broadcasting uh, company, and I know that a lot of journalists in Uzbekistan, they strive to be professionals. They want to be professionals, and I think this is one of those you know, historic periods when they are trying to basically reach out and say, hey, help us. And then our response, of course, to them is, well, help us help you. So, you know, what, what can we do? And, uh, you know, what can we do together? What are our common values? What are our co common interests? How can we do things together uh, with them? I think the, the, the critical question for organizations like the Voice of America, Radio <laughs> Liberty, and, you know, BBC <coughs> is that, you know, do we want to work? with the state media, specifically state media, especially if when the national news agency is reaching out or other um, state channels are reaching out to you, they want to interview you and they want to feature you, for example, you know, as, as someone who's, uh, who's, uh, who's doing things outside of, outside of the country. So I think that's something for us to figure out. I think each organization is really sitting and uh, wondering about that. Um, and that, I think, is the necessary prerequisite for establishing a more professional media in, in Uzbekistan. I think it's time to be really constructive. It's time to be really strategic. Um, myself and my colleagues at the BBC and Radio Liberty were recently asked to um, do a video address to a group of journalists who were gathered in Fergana. And this event, this media workshop, was organized by Fergana Journalist Union, speaking of some of the civil societies um, in the country. So they wanted us, each of us, to do 15 minutes. 15 minutes is a long time, you know, mm -hmm. to do a video address. And, um, and they said, well, run it as it is, and this is your chance to, 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 to talk to your colleagues um, at home. And we did it. It went very well. Uh, the, our video addresses will be public. The feedback has been incredible. I've gotten dozens of letters from journalists who are both critical and, of course, complimentary. And I think this kind of constructive engagement is, 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 is a development, and we, I think we need to welcome that. Um, and when I was in Uzbekistan this summer, I, talked, I spent a lot of time talking to journalists who seemed very energized and inspired in this new age, uh, as, they, uh, as they said, but they're still very much constrained. And and uh, you know, they say, well, we need training, we need expertise, we need, we need resources, of course. And many of them do not hide the fact that they're more comfortable working within the limits that they're so used to. So going beyond the limits actually makes them very uncomfortable. They're used to that you know, comfort zone. It's so much easier to go to a government, get another event you know, in, in Tashkent and talk about how 40 people you know, gather today to uh, basically you know, cheer yet another you know, policy by, uh, by the government. So what specifically has been the nature of change thus far? 
We see more local coverage, uh, more focus on domestic issues uh, in, 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 in Uzbek media, such as the economy, uh, specifically employment and pay, government services, such as supply of energy, water, gas, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality. And one of the most covered issues um, is also the lack of housing in Uzbekistan. So these are really sensitive issues that no media was were talking about a year ago. Uh, there is increasing focus on migrant work, export of labor force, uh, and the media are asking some elemental questions that uh, were not really part of the discussion previously. For instance, you know, why are people seeking jobs abroad? How much are they making? Is it worth it? How much are they contributing to the to the local economy? The struggles of the migrant workers in Russia and elsewhere. And I'm sure many of you have heard what happened in Kazakhstan last week when you know 52 Uzbeks died in this bus fire, uh, you know, tragedy in Kazakhstan. And, and then, of course, the president of Uzbekistan comes out and says, you know, we should also feel responsible. We failed out of the at providing opportunities for our citizens, and this is the reason why people are going to faraway places to make a living. I mean, to me as a journalist, I'm like, wow. I mean, isn't that something that we wanted to hear from the Uzbek government a century ago, you know? And, and of course, that sparks uh, heated debates and more open conversations, specifically online, about where the country is today. And to me, I think that's a really good positive development. Of course, president's speeches and remarks continue to drive the content. Uh, and debate over pretty much every issue in the country. His remarks, his voice is the green light to basically talk about any sensitive issue. And um, you know, and people are getting more expressive and daring as his remarks are getting more expressive and daring. So Mirziaev, to my mind, is going to be the most crucial element in this. You know, in uh, in determining the scope, depth, and uh, and pace of change. And of course, this this opening in Uzbekistan that we've been you know observing. Online Uzbekistan is very vibrant now, uh, with many sources in, inside the country. Uh, until recently, there was this virtual Uzbekistan, you know, where we had a lot of critical voices, and then there was real Uzbekistan, where a lot of people chose not to say anything. Either they were afraid, or they were just angry with all the critical, you know, voices uh, in, in virtual Uzbekistan. And I think for the past one year, that uh, gap between virtual and real Uzbekistan has been shrinking. Again, slowly, but it's been shrinking. You see incredibly heated, interesting, constructive debates between bloggers and activists. In some cases, they end up blocking each other. But what happens in that process is that a lot comes out. Grievances come out, you know, ideas come out, thoughts come out. And this is a good therapy for a society like Uzbekistan, where, uh, you know, keeping yourself informed is very um, difficult. If, you know, if government wants to succeed in these reforms, it needs an informed public. And obviously, informed public then requires informed government. So I think that is something for the you know for the government to recognize. And I think there is a slow recognition of that uh, bitter truth. But they're moving obviously very uh, very very um, slowly. The society, in many ways, I think, is learning to communicate with itself. And you know, when we hear, for example, today's news was well, yesterday's news was that the, the governor of the Fergana region, you know, um, is, is is reported secretly in a media way. He's screaming and and cursing um, the people the, who are related to the victims of what happened in Kazakhstan last week, and he was calling them bastards, you know. And this is all coming in ugly, you know, Uzbek. Uh, it's made public, and people are really, you know, discussing this, and a lot of people feel very uncomfortable hearing this. And to me, as a journalist, I'm like, good, feel uncomfortable. You know, this is what a lot of you have been saying for a long time. Hear each other. Like, hear each other. And, and, and then, you know, that then that pushes, I think, people to, um, to look at themselves. I think it really encourages critical thinking. Because at the end of the day, you know, to be able to answer to that question, like, how free are Uzbek media today? The question, the preliminary question before that is, what does freedom mean in the current context? And what does critical mean, critical thinking mean in the current context in, in Uzbekistan? And I think there is, we see the beginning of that, of that really, you know, sensitive process in the country. Of course, key issues, fundamental problems remain. You know, when Uzbek officials talk about media freedom, they always talk about how thousands of media outlets there are there in the country. But they too know that it's actually about 
content. And it's about the resources. It's about the level of freedom these media organizations have. But they think they can get away by bragging about numbers. And I think many journalists inside the country are reminding authorities now that, you know, actually good content matters. Because we see many good content providers inside the country now. And I think that's, you know, that's really nice. I'm going to uh, talk about them a little bit later. But media organizations obviously lack expertise. They need um, training. Um, we, cannot, um, we cannot stress on this more. Uh, Uzbekistan lacks journalism schools and programs. Uzbekistan lacks real um, civil society and proactive trade organizations that can actually fight for the interests and rights of journalists, you know, above all. Uh, online media is, is definitely the most active media in the country now. They're colorful, rel relatively uh, diverse content, but most of the content is not original. They are either translated from Russian or from other languages, poorly written, poorly referenced, uh, lots of reviews of international media. But there are some major news organizations, outlets uh, such as, you know, Kun'uz or Gazeta.uz, Dario.uz, Sof.uz, uh, and some of them are actually run by emerging, aspiring young journalists, and I think we should really keep an eye on them too, so Dia.uz, for those of you who may be interested, and also Correspondent.uz. And, and I've met with some of the managers, you know, managing editors of these sites, and they're very ambitious. They're very ambitious and they're very uh, uh, energetic. But again, they will tell you that all of them are struggling and trying to find out where the red line is. But some of them also believe that, you know, in pushing the envelope slowly, you know, one story at a time, and, um, and see what happens, right? Broadcast media, obviously, Uzbek State Broadcasting Company is still a monopoly. There are more TV channels in Uzbekistan now. 10 at least under the uh, National Broadcasting Company. Diverse topics and you know more variety, interactive shows, very influenced by the Russian media, especially in style and format. Some analytical shows, but very little critical content. Unless, of course, they're talking about, they're referencing everything to President Mirziyoyev, who's the biggest, or the only critic in the country, you know? Uh, print media, quite similar to online and broadcast media, but they, they devote a lot of space to the coverage or to, um, you know, president's speeches, remarks, degrees, and also a lot of space is given to sort of what, what I call morality lessons by local intellectuals, you know, how to be a good Uzbek, you know, uh, what do, uh, what should great Uzbeks do, you know, how we should uh, uh, help each other, and also, um, and many see this as intellectual food, as very necessary intellectual food for the country. Uh, but many also do not deny that print media, as it is, especially official print media, uh, do not reflect the real life in the country. Now, uh, one last point. I think it's, uh, and many of us have dealt with this issue uh, in this room. Part of what enables a professional media is having a professional government. So to put it uh, another way, in another way, if public officials cannot communicate, um, you know, with me clearly, dispassionately, you know, and uh, responsibly, then the public loses, right? And I think that's something that the government has not yet realized. So, so the government is a big part of the problem that needs solving too here. The good news is that official Uzbekistan is relatively active now. You see, you know, press services trying to do something about what they're supposed to do. Uh, and there is definitely, you know, more outreach to the public. But the bad news is that the overall attitude toward media uh, has not changed. The government lacks expertise and training, of course. Uh, you know, it's, it's evident, uh, very much, very, very much evident everywhere. But this starts actually at the very top. So from the presidential press office down to the most local authorities, the problem is the same. Press services lack the basic understanding of why they need to engage media. You know, why they need to have a professional relationship uh, with media. Of course, all governments and politicians want to influence uh, media. They all want to shape uh, the perception. But the Uzbek government only knows how to do so by bossing around, by controlling everything. You know, so in short, the state, in my view, has no media strategy, the government. Uh, and it's funny because they talk so much about reforms, but they have forgotten the basic, you know. Uh, so it needs one, and press services can't just, you know, act as controllers of state um, 
uh, outlets or even those you know online sources based in the country while refusing to communicate or answer any inquiries by both domestic and, and, and foreign media who want to ask real questions. They simply ignore. And you know this and they especially, you know, they get very scared when uh, organizations like us who offer content in native language, you know, inquires. So this problem, uh, to me, extends globally. Of course, the representatives of, of the Uzbek government, um, uh, you know, they simply, I mean, I, I hate to use this word, but they suck at communication in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I don't see any representatives from the embassy here. Of course, they wouldn't be here because, you know, we're talking about Uzbekistan and they can afford to miss that, right? I mean, this is something that my ongoing, you know, discussion with the Uzbek diplomats that, you know, they, they're always like silent observers. You know, they have a lot, a lot of grievances, but they are always uh, afraid to share uh, those grievances. And these are, these are places where they can come and at least, you know, listen. So... <coughs> Embassies, along with the foreign ministry, which, by the way, President Mirziyoyev recently called uh, as being incapable of executing the foreign policy of the country, he wants to do major reforms there, they either have no people responsible dealing with media, or uh, they're just afraid to deal uh, to deal with media. So diplomats reach out individually if they need, uh, you know, if they need uh, cooperation. But in general, again, there is they don't know how to deal with you if you approach them. As, as a professional you know, journalist wanting to know uh, some things. So to circle back to um, where I began, you know, Uzbekistan cannot have a free media environment unless the government views communication itself as a professional vocation. You know, you have to just make peace with the fact that you, your officials need to nurture this, uh, uh, you know, professional attitude. They need to have a professional attitude toward media, whether they are local, you know, Uzbek journalists or, or foreign journalists. And it needs to change now more than ever, because guess what? You know, president has been making some unprecedented remarks almost on a daily basis. He's the biggest newspaper, newsmaker in the country. And your, 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 your the lack of communication services within the system is failing to highlight those things. You know, and then you cannot block those who are highlighting. For example, I wasn't blocked by the Uzbek president's, uh, you know, Twitter account until September when I was tweeting, live tweeting about what Mirziyoyev was saying on Independence Day. I was actually highlighting some of the good things that he was talking about and all of a sudden I'm blocked. Mm -hmm. And I bet you these people who are blocking us, they have no idea what is being said. So, you know, I mean, they're just afraid. And I know that the Committee to Protect Journalists is blocked by them too, which is a shame. Um, so, you know, and then we have a question of accreditation, which is still a very painful process, uh, involving several parts of the Uzbek government with no one taking a leading role. I hear, I constantly hear that changes are coming, but so far uh, we haven't seen much. So um, that's that. I'll try in this last uh, presentation to address the situation and the evolution of uh, education in Uzbekistan. I mean, well, like uh, in many, like many other sectors, uh, the president, uh, the new president, Mr. Yeyev, has said a lot. Uh, well, and I quote him, he said that well, youth education is one of the most important issues uh, for the country right now. And he has declared, of course, that he wants to uh, launch many reforms in this sector, and he has actually already uh, launched uh, many of them. So what I would like to do uh, in this short uh, presentation, in this short talk, is first to present briefly some of the main uh, challenges that Uzbekistan, that uh, education in Uzbekistan is facing. Uh, in the second point, what kind of reforms the new president has launched and how local people react to these reforms, at least to some of uh, these reforms. And in the last point, what impact Mezayev's new policy and reforms could have on foreign education assistance uh, in uh, this country. So, uh, first point, uh, Islam, uh, Islam Karimov, well, of course, made uh, education an official uh, priority. But uh, since independence, I mean, education in Uzbekistan has been facing a lot of issues, many, many problems. Of course, I mean, I won't have time to address uh, all of them, but briefly, and to uh, simplify a little bit, I would say that education has been facing three kinds of issues, economic, 
social and political. Uh, first, the, the economical one. Uh, from the 1990s, uh, due to big uh, budget constraints, the Uzbek state had to reduce by one third the percentage of GDP, uh, which was devoted to education. Uh, and this budget, despite several increases uh, over the last uh, 15 years, uh, has remained for a long time well below, the, for example, the OECD standards for developed countries and even for uh, developing countries. And in 2012, uh, the average percentage of national revenue, revenue given to education was 3.4%, which, uh, uh, <coughs> which is low, which remains under uh, the, the world standards, even if officially about 7.5% of GDP flowed to education uh, in 2014. So uh, despite uh, several increases, uh, from the 2000s, uh, this budgetary shortfalls had many consequences, of course. Among some of them, I mean, this led the political authorities uh, to prioritize secondary education at the expense of uh, other levels, and this has, uh, several, this has had several consequences. First, uh, nursery schools have considerably declined in all the country. In the 2000s and 2010, only 22% of uh, Uzbekistani Uzbekist children had access to childhood care and education. And today, uh, according to some uh, several sources, close to <coughs> at least 1,000 schools have fallen into disrepair. As for primary uh, schools, despite a high enrollment, uh, enrollment ratio, which is close to 100%, for a variety of reasons, at the start of the 2010s, almost 180,000 Uzbekistani children were not regularly attending a primary school, which equaled uh, half of all Central Asian uh, <coughs> children outside the school uh, system. And as I said, although uh, the government focused on uh, its efforts on secondary teaching, uh, in, uh, in 1997 it reduced the time of uh, obligatory instruction for, from uh, 11 to 9 years. And besides, many secondary schools operate according to a system of uh, two or three rotations. I mean, the pupils are schooled for only a few hours per day in order to make space for uh, all the pupils before, I mean, earlier or later uh, in the day. And lastly, at the tertiary level, the government has greatly uh, increased the number of uh, higher institutions from 37 in 1991 to 59 in the mid-2010s uh, uh, and even 75 in 2017 to respond to the quickly uh, increasing number of applicants which grew from uh, 540,000 in 2014 to almost 730,000 in 2017. So this is really a huge uh, increase. But even if the government uh, increased the number of high institutions, uh, the percentage of applicants uh, for tertiary studies and who managed uh, to get into a university has significantly uh, declined, going from 15% under the Soviet regime, uh, more precisely in 1986, to 9% only uh, in the mid of uh, the 2010s, which means that only one applicant out of 11 is able to enter in university in Uzbekistan, which is a really low figure compared to many other countries uh, in the world. The second problem that Uzbekistan is, education is facing are, of course, uh, some so, are related to some social uh, issues. The decline in uh, living standards of a part of the population and the increasingly elevated uh, school fees uh, led to a decline uh, in enrollment. For example, 
according to, according to the World Bank, in the end of the 2000s, only 5% of children from Uzbekistan's less advantaged family were enrolled in nursery schools, compared to 46% of children from the country's uh, wealthiest families. And this, these disparities are even more pronounced uh, in uh, tertiary education. Almost 60% of university students belong to the quintile uh, of the most well-off families. So considering that, for example, today, more than uh, two-thirds of students study on a fee basis at the bachelor level, level sorry, and three-quarters at master's level, this means that many Uzbek households are unable to afford uh, the enrollment fees and sometimes cannot even pay uh, for lodging or transport to uh, university. So, of course, these inequalities substantially uh, impact the country's development since they contribute to increase higher school dropout rates, to reduce the development of capacities of youth from underprivileged backgrounds, and, to, and that, that this maintains them in, uh, in the cycle of poverty. And third point, last but not least, of course, the Uzbek government authoritarianism has considerably curbed uh, education reforms. Of course, officially, according to the law uh, on education, which was passed in August uh, 1997, which was the main law on education, education is about uh, forming a free and independent person with the uh, ability to participate actively in social and political life and about promoting democratic principles and so on. Yet, uh, beyond this uh, official rhetoric, the whole education system from kindergarten to uh, university has remained highly uh, region-centric, uh, really based on state ideology. And as a specialist on education in, uh, uh, in Central Asia uh, has said, uh, Safaros Niyozov, uh, and I quote him, uh, Soviet lies have, replaced, uh, uh, have been replaced sorry, with new truths, which differ in scope and detail, but not much in nature and purpose. <laughs> so, uh, from the uh, what we have seen is that in Uzbekistan from the 1990s, uh, the Uzbek government's personality curbed heavily imposed itself on curricula. School curricula remain largely stamped by the Soviet conception of a, uni a unique truth. And students remained, I would say, to summarize, perceived as uh, knowledge receivers, more, much more than as uh, knowledge producers. So uh, this is, of course, very, very briefly presented some of the issues that education in, in Uzbekistan uh, is facing. The list is, of course, not uh, exhaustive. But the, the arrival, and I'm, going, I'm coming to my second point, uh, the arrival of a new president in 2016 has opened new perspectives. In a little bit more than a year, I mean, Mirzoyev has undertaken many reforms in the sector. Uh, I want, of course, to list all, uh, all of them and all, uh, all the projects. Let me just mention maybe some of the main ones. For example, a Ministry of Preschool Education and a, a specialized training for uh, preschool teachers, uh, specialized training center, sorry, for preschool teachers were created uh, last year in 2017 with uh, the goal to increase by 1.5 times the enrollment of uh, children by 2021. Where another uh, reform is that whereas uh, Karimov pre uh, prevented the development of private schools, now, I mean, from 2018, uh, private kindergartens and schools will be able to work in Uzbekistan, and a great system will be created to train uh, talented uh, children in their schools. Four teachers, uh, regional teachers, training centers will be opened and funded by the state to raise their level, which is considered uh, too low. The government has also tried uh, to increase the number of students at university, both on grants and uh, on grant and fee uh, basis, by increasing the number of places uh, in the uni university, but also by creating more and more evening classes or by uh, correspondence courses. So, uh, 
there are really plenty of, uh, of, of uh, initiatives uh, that uh, MSIF is trying to, uh, to, to launch. Now, two points here. First, uh, it's of course too early to measure the impact of many of these reforms, initiatives, and uh, decisions. And second, some of the uh, reforms launched raise, of course, questions. And I will mention here uh, three examples. Uh, the first one is that some of these reforms, I would say, are uh, elaborated uh, hastily. For example, Mr. Yeh have decided to launch the revision and the publication of, new, of a number of new textbooks, uh, which is, of course, uh, a very good thing, considering the regime-centric uh, uh, approach of textbooks under Karimov. But the pressure, I mean, I had some interviews, I, I, I spent a few weeks in, uh, in, in Uzbekistan last October, and I had some interviews, uh, and the pre I, what I heard is that the pressure uh, on the textbooks new authors were such that according uh, to them, uh, uh, some of them had actually to rewrite uh, these textbooks in only two weeks. So uh, it's, uh, uh, this was, of course, uh, this was uh, raising some uh, concern, of course. The uh, second example is that, as I already said, uh, Mirzayev wants to allow a high percentage of high school students to access universities. And of course, again, this is a good point. Uh, but among the measures he has adopted, he has decided to match as much as possible the number of colleges to the number of universities, which would make easier uh, for students to go, of course, from high school, from colleges to, uh, to universities. And of course, well, uh, this chosen policy, this policy has raised many questions because uh, one of the decisions of the government as to, uh, he has decided to close 67 of 144 high schools, which really caused a wave of panic uh, among some parents that uh, I, I talked to. And the third point, uh, Mirzi Yoyev has also decided to bring uh, compulsory schooling back to uh, 11 years, which again is likely to be uh, an important and uh, a good decision. But this decision uh, involves some 22,000 additional teachers. So now the question is how to recruit teachers. And I'm asking this question because as a profession of teaching, uh, which was very prestigious under the Soviet Union, uh, has lost actually most of its prestige uh, in Uzbekistan. Actually, not only in Uzbekistan. This is a case in all republics of Central Asia, and this is also the case, I guess, I mean, uh, in many other uh, post-Soviet uh, 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 republic. But uh, I mean, but why? I mean, this profession has lost. Uh, and I'm going back to Uzbekistan. Why this profession has lost its prestige? Uh, for example, the average salary of a school teacher or professor is less than $200 a month, which is largely and, uh, 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 not enough to ensure a decent uh, standard of living, which means that many uh, teachers are obliged to have seven jobs to meet the needs of, uh, of their family. Then their purchase power, that's what a lot of uh, teachers complain about, their purchasing power is even more reduced by some uh, supplementary deductions, such as, for example, the obligation to subscribe to newspapers, to state newspapers and journals. So a teacher, and uh, be, uh, beyond that, uh, teachers criticize what they deem is an excessive workload because apart from uh, the already heavy load of teaching, many of them are compelled to do additional duties such as maintenance of the school premises or are regularly mobilized for the Subotniki, for example. <laughs> so all these conditions, of course, have a huge impact on the profession and on the level of, the, of teachers, on their motivation. Well, first, uh, the, uh, these conditions breed an immense corruption of the teaching body, uh, and especially uh, at the tertiary level. 
Second, they have the motivated a growing number of students graduating from teaching colleges, I mean pedagogical institute. Uh, many, what we see is that many change their career after graduation or leave the profession after only a few years of teaching and go to uh, more uh, remunerative profession. So in 2017, it was estimated that Uzbek schools lack as many as 20 to 25 percent of teachers. So uh, uh, the problem of teacher is therefore a, re a kind of tricky question in Uzbekistan. And I would say that even under uh, Wow, okay, all right. Even <laughs> under the previous regime, when Karimov took the decision in 2012 uh, to prohibit teachers from working more than one and a half times with their regular workloads, many teachers actually, actually considered <coughs> that this measure was in, uh, impossible to, uh, to, to implement. And my last point, because I have only five, uh, uh, five minutes left, uh, so what is the impact of Mirzoyev's will to reform the sector on Western engagement in Uzbekistan, on Western education assistance uh, in the country? Uh, well, foreign education assistance, its modalities and its impact, of course, continue to be intensely debated. And, and I, would quote, I would quote here two, of the, mo two uh, of the most famous specialists on foreign education assistance, uh, Abby Riddle and Miguel Nino Zarazua. Uh, there is actually, of course, there is no set and established blueprint of what to do, uh, uh, sorry, of what to do that can be applied gener generally to all countries. So my goal, of course, here is not to uh, get into the huge debates. Uh, on foreign education assistance. I don't have time to do that. But one of the points that could be of, uh, of consequence on Western involvement is, uh, I mean, I don't mean a real process, of course, of democratization, and I totally agree with Sean. I mean, we really have to remain extremely cautious about it. But at least a certain decrease, uh, very moderate decrease uh, of, authority, of authoritarianism and maybe a greater openness to cooperation with uh, foreign uh, countries. Uh, for example, Karimov, as you know, uh, and as Shen said, uh, largely endured uh, Western assistance, which it worried could spread, I mean, uh, ideas capable of causing so-called color revolutions and so on. And he had consequently largely restricted uh, the access of international organizations or NGOs in general, or in general foreign uh, donors to uh, local uh, stakeholders, for example, to teachers. So, uh, so but despite, as I said, uh, many uh, debates and disagreements among specialists on the stakes and impacts on foreign education assistance, a huge majority of them consider that it is essential to go beyond cooperating mainly with the ruling elites. Why? First, because by addressing the needs uh, that have been defined by, I would say, a clique at the top, I mean, uh, an elite at the top, which is marked by its exclusivity, by authoritarianism, and by corruption, foreign assistance may actually uh, contribute to increasing the risk of instability in the country. And second, because uh, in any society, knowledge, of course, is not a continuous flow that is transmitted from the top uh, to, uh, to the bottom, and from the bottom to the top, but Knowledge is decentralized, knowledge is dispersed among individuals, among organizations, and so on. So, and any government, whatever its authoritarianism, whatever its control of a society, does not always have the resources to evaluate the needs and the difficulties of the sector or to implement reforms at the local levels. And under, under Karimov, uh, local stakeholders, that is, I'm, talking about, for example, teachers, parents, and students, have been very rarely uh, included in the process of making decisions on, uh, on reforms. And as a result, uh, reforms have often been ill-received. 
and for foreign uh, assistance, and I take here uh, the example of the EU, which has been trying to engage a lot uh, in education here in Uzbekistan, this lack of local connection has considerably limited its ability to evaluate the needs of Uzbekistani society, and as a result, to adapt its project to the local situation. And so this lack of local stakeholders' ownership has led uh, some Uzbekistani stakeholders to resist, actually, reforms uh, suggested by uh, the EU. One example, uh, several scholars have uh, noted the very limited impact uh, of European and Western uh, projects that have pressed teachers to switch, for example, from uh, teacher-centered to child-centered uh, uh, learning. For many teachers in Uzbekistan, concepts like that, such as uh, student-centered learning, is sustainable uh, and uh, is unsustainable, uh, and will be real, uh, will be will, will be implemented. Uh, won't be able, won't be implemented. Sorry, unless there is a significant improvement in their social conditions, uh, for example, an increase in salaries, uh, uh, lighting of the workload, the political liberalisation, just to make them more motivated to implement this kind of reforms coming from the European Union or from uh, the United States. So uh, the question now is whether changes initiated under uh, the government of President Mizoyev have opened up new possibilities for assistance. Uh, I mean, Mizoyev's overall reforms also uh, could provide a more access for cooperation with local stakeholders, which has been largely restricted, as I said, under uh, Karimov, as well as maybe so, uh, uh, possibilities for engagement with non-governmental organization, local, govern, uh, local government, and the private sector. So I conclude very, very quickly, in just one uh, 30 seconds. I mean, so obviously there's a real desire to change things. A uh, number of decisions are welcome. For example, developing nursery schools uh, that have collapsed is essential. I mean, I guess uh, we don't need to elaborate a lot on it. The positive effect uh, of early childhood care and education has, will, has been extremely well uh, documented. But uh, it's of course still early to measure the impact of these reforms. Uh, for example, uh, it would be possible to speak about the effectiveness of the reform only uh, in a few years. Uh, for example, in the case of private schools and a new system of kindergarten, it will, uh, it will take at least 10 years before the first results can be Esti uh, estimated. So many of the points actually I uh, address today remain more like questions than uh, responses, but at least even if uh, the Uzbek government is very, very likely to remain authoritarian, uh, it is at least, I think, maybe more aware than Carrie Murph of the urgent necessity to try to improve uh, the human capital for the development of the country. But again, let's see what happens in the next two or three years. Thank you.